the 20th chapter of Acts, where we're at in our study of the book of Acts, we have a, a narrative in the first several verses, actually, the first 17 verses. Um, there's not much doctrine uh, or instruction in these verses, but what we have is a portrait or a picture of the Apostle Paul and the type of man he was, the type of leader he was, a, a very devoted man, um, loving, compassionate. But I, I would say that the Apostle Paul was just absolutely sold out to Jesus. Now we know from our previous study that uh, he didn't take any money for his work for the church. He was what he can, he considered himself uh, self-employed. He was a tent maker, which basically meant he was a, a leather worker. But of course, he probably made tents too. But Paul is so different when you think about it. Such an amazing transformation from the loving apostle Paul that's devoted to the gospel to Saul of Tarsus who was a hater, persecutor, killer of Christians. And I, and I think that all of us can take great comfort in knowing that we may have done a lot of things in our past that we're not proud of. And certainly Christ isn't proud of. But all that can be changed. Our hearts can be changed. Paul was changed in a moment where... Jesus appeared and confronted him, saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he was blinded for a time. And in that three days of blindness, he was humbled. And then Jesus sent a man to him, and the scales fell from his eyes, and he was baptized, and he started a new life. A new life of ministry for the church. But Paul loves the church. And that is the standard for the effectiveness of a minister. The love of the church is what makes a minister effective. And you all are the church. And I have a love for you all. I hope, I hope you realize that. That's why Paul was so effective. His love was founded on a great love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And hopefully, we all have that love for Jesus Christ in our hearts because He gave up His life for us. He was willing to die on a cross as a criminal so that we might be able to uh, be received in heaven by God. And it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. You may have been a Christian for, for a lifetime. You know, you may have come to Christ like I did as a kid. Or you might have come in your 20s. You might have come... I baptized a man at Sewell who was 70 years old. And it took his wife getting killed in a car accident to bring him to the Lord. And, and we just never know how God's going to work things out for us. But it get back to my point, it doesn't matter when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's ready and willing to take you as you are. Paul's love for the church absolutely consumed him. It was paramount on his mind every day. It was paramount in his prayers. It was paramount in his teaching, his preaching, his encouragement, his fellowship with the church. It was what he was absolutely devoted to. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, we get a, a good uh, picture again of how the Apostle Paul loved the church. Let me just read the first eight verses to you. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. 
I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers, for all of you, I always pray with joy because your partnership in the Gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this, that He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the Gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Isn't that just a, a, a beautiful statement of how Paul loved the church in Philippi? We have another example of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Paul says, you yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on human tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Paul loved the church in Corinth. And then, Back to Thessalonians, as Jim read this morning, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. This is what he writes to the church in Thessalonica, and he uses a good analogy here. But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for our children, or for their little children. You know, there's, and you ladies know this, I'm, I'm just speaking like I do, but there is nothing like a mother's love. A mother's love is unconditional. Uh, a mother just, I think God instills uh, the love that a mother has for his child or her child just automatically. It's instinctive. We love you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the Gospel of God. It's one thing to, to love somebody so much that you share the Gospel with them, which will probably involve you spilling your guts and sharing your personal testimony with them. You know All the things that you did in your past that Jesus has helped you overcome. That's one thing. But it's another, Paul says, but our lives we give to you as well because you had become so dear to us. Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 13, well, I better turn to it or I'll mess it up. I thought I had it memorized. John chapter 15, verses, or verse 13, greater, no, greater love has no one than this that he lay down his life for his friends. Greater love has no one than this that he lay down his life for his friends. This is the kind of love that Paul had. Paul demonstrates his love for the church in this 20th chapter uh, of Acts in five ways. This is what uh, John MacArthur said in his sermon. He says that Paul showed his love for the church by his affection. He embraced them. He showed his love visibly by his giving. Paul is currently on a mission here in Acts chapter 20. He's on a mission to collect an offering for the church in Jerusalem. And he's traveling hundreds of miles by foot and by ship to get that offering there. His love for the church is demonstrated by his teaching. In verse 2, he says that he gave them much exhortation or encouragement. He showed his love by his persistence. Paul was never deterred by any trouble, present or future. He just kept on task and stayed on task. And then Paul demonstrated his love for the church by being available. He was always available to the people in his church. He made himself available. He gave up his own time for others to go and see to their needs, to go and uh, show them love and encouragement. So, 
what we've got here in verses 1 through 12 this morning is just a simple narrative. Let's read it together. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through the area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece where he stayed three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus, from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy, and also Tychicus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. Notice how it changes to us. That means that Luke's with them now. Luke's with them at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting, and seated in the window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke, bre broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were comforted. Let's read a few more here. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Azos, for we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made arrangements because he was going there on foot. When he met us in Azos, we took him on board and we sailed to Miletus. The next day, we set sail from there and arrived at Chios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos and on the following day arrived at Miletus. Paul decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. For Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. Now we go back to verse 1. Paul said when the uproar had ended, he sent for the disciples. Well, we remember what the uproar was. There was a great riot in the city of Ephesus. And Paul was held back from uh, going out and trying to calm the people in the riot. So the uproar died down, and Paul sent for the disciples. And when they came, he encouraged them. Some uh, uh, translations say he exhorted them, which basically means he was teaching them. He was teaching them about the things of Jesus. And so he set sail, uh, he said goodbye to them, and he set sail for Macedonia. So Paul leaves Ephesus, and he's headed to Asia. It says he traveled through the area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and he finally arrived in Greece. So he goes from Ephesus to Corinth, the city of Corinth. And he stayed for three months. Now the reason he stayed for three months, if, if we uh, trust Luke historically, and we do, is that Paul has been traveling to, to Corinth and it's now winter time. And there are no ships available for him to set sail to uh, go to his next uh, destination. So he stays in Greece for three months. We read in the next verse that the Jews made a plot against him. We all know that the Judaizers were constantly accusing Paul of being a lawbreaker, and, and Paul was no longer following the law as they did traditionally. But we read through the next uh, five verses that where there were several men 
from several different regions that followed or went along with the Apostle Paul. And this is uh, interesting to note because not only did Paul ask and encourage for a collection for the poor church in Jerusalem, he had men from each church go with him with the offering. Let's say we, uh, like we did in the past, took up an offering for Shiloh. Well, instead of sending it in the mail, we sent a representative with the check. Okay. Now, there were no checks back in Paul's time, and there probably wasn't any even in paper currency. So what they had were silver and gold coins. And we don't know whether it was in a chest or whether it was in sacks, but all these men went with Paul for a very specific reason. First of all, well, two reasons. First of all, just as I said, they were being the actual stewards of the money representing the churches that they came from. But all these men went with Paul, and Paul could not be falsely accused of pocketing any money. Okay? Not to mention the fact that as they were traveling, there were all kinds of thieves and robbers that could uh, basically, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, mug them. Uh, beat them up and steal their money. You know, So Paul had safety in numbers. And so they traveled to the city of Troas. And this is really where I want to camp out because this is such a neat section of Scripture. The reason it's so neat is because we have a picture of the early church coming together for instruction and communion and what was called a love feast where they basically had a potluck. Okay? Verse 7, On the first day of the week we came together to break bread. The first day of the week. What's the first day of the week? Sunday. They didn't come together on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is no longer the day spent for worship. It's Sunday, the first day of the week. Um, it's interesting that the Jews did not have names for days like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Everything was based on Sabbath. Two days prior to the Sabbath. Two days after the Sabbath. They didn't have a name for, for days. Now they did call Friday the preparation day. But notice they say the first day of the week. So the first day of the week is after the Sabbath. And they came together to break bread. Now there's two possibilities that we should consider in what Luke means breaking bread. First, they could have came together for a love feast where everybody brought something and they all shared a meal together. Or this could mean that they came together on the first day of the week to break bread as a form of communion. And I think this first example of breaking bread is communion. And the reason I do is because Luke specifically says on the first day of the week we came together to break bread. He's following Jesus' instruction to, to be remembered in His death by the breaking of bread and the taking of the cup. So after they had had this time of what I believe is communion, Paul spoke to the people. Now, his intentions, it says by Luke, was to leave the next day. So Paul wanted to give them the whole lot of information that he had to share with them. So he spoke until midnight. Now, if I go past 40 minutes, it has a profound effect on you all. And I can see it whether you think I can or not. It says, Paul kept talking among uh, till, until midnight, and Luke adds an interesting uh, little note hit here. He says there were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting. Okay, first century Palestinian homes had a uh, uh, first floor where the bedrooms were and a living area, and then the upper rooms were more open. Okay, there weren't a lot of walls inside the upper rooms. And what's happened here is the church has come together in this house 
to fellowship, to break bread, to receive instruction from Paul. It's so crowded that this one man, this one young man is seated in the windowsill. Paul's going on and on. You can imagine it's packed. Okay, Eutychus is sitting in the windowsill because there's nowhere else to sit. It's packed with people. It's getting hot. And these lamps are burning oil and there's these fumes in the room. And Eutychus is... Uh, he's fighting sleep. He's fighting sleep and he's losing the battle. Now, I'm not going to mention any names. But it's been a few years ago. We had a family that, that, that came to church here and, and they don't anymore. But anyways, uh, the younger man of the family would sit back there behind Connie and that son would come through that window and shine down on him. And oh, oh, he, I could just see him fighting sleep, you know, and I'd, I'd, try to, I'd try to hit something really hard, you know, with a, oh, this is what Paul did, and, and that might pep him up, but I always felt, felt sorry for him because I understood it, it can get sleepy in church. But this is what happened to Eutychus. He was seating in the window. There was no glass. Okay, they did, have sh they did have shutters, though, that opened and closed. But he was sitting in the windowsill, and Paul was talking on and on, and this young man, Eutychus, fell asleep. He slumped down and bang, fell out of the third story window, hit the ground, and was dead. Now, we can be confident in the fact that this young man was dead for a very specific reason. We, we need to remember, Luke is a physician. He's a doctor. Luke would have known whether this young man was dead or not dead. But he records, he was dead. So the Apostle Paul hurries down and he threw himself on the young man lays on top of him and he wraps his arms around him. Now, we don't know why he did this, although Elijah and Elisha did the same thing when, when they resurrected a dead body. And so maybe that's what Paul was thinking, that this is the way it's done. But he goes down and he gets on top of the young man, puts his arms around him, and he raises him from the dead. Raises him from the dead. It says in verse 12 that the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Now you bring somebody back to life, that's going to make a real impression on people. Okay. Now, now we hear about uh, operating room um, resuscitations where people's hearts stop beating and, and they use the paddles and they shock them and they get their heart beating again. That's not at all what Paul did. Paul didn't even perform CPR on this young man. He just laid on top of him and made a pronouncement. Um, Paul tells that uh, he wants to... Oh, where did I have that? Paul wants to understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what he writes in Philippians chapter 3. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. I think, I think Paul realized the power of Jesus' resurrection because that's where His power come from was the Holy Spirit of Christ living in Him. So, Paul raises this young man and then it says, He went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. Okay. Now I think what we have here is a love feast. A potluck. Basically because it says he broke bread and ate. I don't consider when we have communion and, and we take uh, a wafer, and in their case they would have had a loaf of bread and broke it off and passed it around, I don't consider that eating. Do you? No. It's, it's a sharing of the Lord's Supper. Luke says that they broke bread and ate. And ate is a past tense word. They had a meal. They had a meal together. And then Paul talks on until daylight. The man preaches all night other than 
this meal. And, and you can imagine he's having a meal with all these church people and they're picking his brain. Well, what about this about Jesus? What about that about Jesus? What does the Old Testament say about this? What you know? They're, they're just pounding him with questions as you would do if you had the Apostle Paul in your presence. So the people took great comfort and went home with Eutychus alive and Paul left at daylight. And what's he do? Well, he doesn't get on a boat, but his buddies do. The companions, Luke says, went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Azos and where we were going to take Paul aboard. Azos is 20 to 30 miles away from Troas. Paul preached all night long, ate in the middle of the night, talked some more until daylight, and then he left and walked 20 miles. What does it tell you about this man's <laughs> physicality? The dude is tough. He is tough. Uh, I see pictures uh, of people, you know, paint or draw of, of images of the Apostle Paul and he's always this, this old man with a long beard and a hunchback and, and a pot belly. No way! The Apostle Paul was tough. He, he was a man's man. There's no doubt in my mind. So he went on there by foot. And when he met us at Azos, we took him on board and we went to Miletus. And the next day we set sail for Chios. There's a day. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos. There's a day. And on the following day, we arrived at Miletus. There's a day. Altogether, what Luke records for us from the time at Troas to the time to arriving at Miletus, 14 days have passed. And Paul has 50 days to get to Jerusalem because he wants to get there before Pentecost. But Paul's not so set in his ways to go straight to Jerusalem. It's amazing what he does. He purposefully sails past Ephesus so he doesn't have to go and visit the church because he is on a timeline. But when he gets to Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. Paul sent for the elders of the church to come to him. He wanted to continue to encourage the church at Ephesus. He, Paul spent probably two to three years with that church in raising it up and growing it. I know this is just a narrative, and we're going to continue talking about Paul and his visit with the elders next time, but what I want you to get out of this morning is that we need to be dedicated to serving the Lord. And not just the coming together at church and being devoted to the Lord's table. And I'm happy that we do that. We should, as a body of believers, come and assemble together to be encouraged by one another. And we should on a weekly basis, as I think Scripture shows, we should take communion every week. And folks, there's nothing wrong with taking communion on a Wednesday. There's nothing wrong with taking communion on a Friday. It doesn't have to be an ordained minister or elder or deacon to pass communion out. You don't have to have one cup. You don't have to have one loaf of bread. There's no instruction about communion other than you come together and you do it. I know it's, it's customary and tradition for us to do it a certain way. You wait till after the preacher's done and then you have communion. We could have communion at the beginning of church. We could have communion as the very fast, last thing we did. It doesn't matter. What matters, what matters, and I want to read this to you and leave you with this thought before we have communion together. What matters is recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Starting in verse 27. Therefore, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. 
A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks in the cup, or drinks of the cup. For anyone who drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And he goes on to say what happens to the Corinthians who aren't doing that. Verse 30, that is why many among you have fallen asleep. Or many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. A lot of them had died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not be a result in judgment. When we come together around this table, the men serving, it's always apparent to me, have on their mind what should be. The, the, the cup of the Lord, the body of the Lord. And we that are participating in communion in the pews, we need to be focusing on Calvary and thinking about what Jesus did for us. It's ironic. We are who we are because Jesus rose from the dead. But He asks us to remember His death. He doesn't give specific instructions about remembering His resurrection. And I think that's because there can't be a resurrection without a death. And Jesus gave up His life for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time that we are about to enter into. Uh, a time, Father, where we can focus our minds on that awful scene on Calvary where the King of the universe freely gave up His life to be the satisfactory offering or sacrifice for our sins. He Himself had no sin in Him. It's just amazing, Father, to think that Jesus loved that group of people that He lived with that much. But even more amazing is that He loved all of us that much. Father, I'm so grateful that Jesus' love was expanded to all of us. That You've allowed us to be in the last days where we can remember what He did and anticipate the fact that He's coming back again. Lord, I know all of us have many things on our plate. We're busy. We live our lives conducting our business and our affairs day to day and we have a lot on our mind. And, and You've given us work to do. We all have professions. And, and we're thankful, Father, that we have that work. But we need to remember that our efforts, whether it be work or play, should be to glorify You. To be an example of Christ to other people to be true to the Gospel. So I just pray, Father, that not only in this time that we're going to share together, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Friday, Saturday, that we remember that we represent Christ and that we are working toward Your will of fulfilling the Great Commission. That means we've got to share our faith with others. We've got to serve our community. We've got to give when it's hard to give sometimes. Just like Jesus gave up so much for us. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.